All right. Well, it is nearly 5 p.m. And so whether you're joining us online or you're joining us here in this very warm room, um, you're very welcome. I, um, I must say that I'm especially excited to have this introduction because this has been, I think, a moment that I've been looking forward to for the last few months and, and weeks. And um, I have spent a little bit of time scanning in all archive materials that I requested from a sort of not quite Indiana Jones-like, but still very mysterious storage place where all keeps all of its historical archives. And um, thanks to a bit of prompting, more of it is now available online than ever before. But I wanted to give a big thank you to David, because I think particularly Helen and I have worked with him over the years to bring Alt's voice to more people in the sector and to infuse it with the criticality and the perspective that is so important to our community. So I know David's here wearing a different hat and I know there are many followers of the apocalypse in the room. So I want to please ask you to put your hands together for a very special session here to celebrate Alt's 30th anniversary. Welcome. Uh, thank you very much, Marin, for that introduction. I can only say in my defence that if Marin asks you to do something, your only question is, when would you like it by? Um, so I'm exquisitely conscious it's a scorching hot day out there. I understand there might be a bar on campus somewhere. I am the only person, the only thing standing between you and a cold glass of the, the um, beverage of your choice. I am conscious of that and I will try not to overrun or test your patience. I'm not going to be doing workshop stuff. I'm not going to make you do any stuff because it's been a long day and I'm just going to invite you to sit back and let me tell you a story. So why do I say that? It's because, I mean, uh, it's because we're humans. It's what we do. We tell stories. We make sense of the world by imposing a narrative on things that happen to us. Um, we make stories of all sorts. We make stories of our lives. We make stories of the lives of others. We make stories of the wider events that we watch in policy or politics or even education technology. We like to think that there is a pattern. We, as humans, we are exquisitely well developed to spot patterns, including, and especially when there are no patterns whatsoever. So um, a prediction is a form of a story. A prediction is a story that we don't know the end of yet, but we can expect the end based on what's happened so far. It's like watching three acts of an action film. You watch the first two acts and you know in the third act there's gonna be loads of explosions and the hero's going to save the day, and everything is going to go back to normal, and everything's going to be lovely. That's what tends to happen in these things. So we can predict what's to come uh, based on what's happened already. I came up with a typology of predictions, which I'll refer to occasionally during this presentation. Uh, first of all, at the top, you can either have an expert prediction or a lay prediction. An expert prediction, if it was about education te um, technology, would be the kind of things I think the people in this room would make. You live and breathe education technology. You work with students, you work with staff, you do that hard work, you do the amazing work that you did um, during the pandemic to keep the whole show on the road where everything else felt like it was um, collapsing. You are the experts. If you make a prediction, it is based on your understanding of the, the subject matter. Um, it's also possible to make a lay prediction. You know, you can um, not be an expert. You can look at some numbers, some stats, and you can think, oh, well, I think probably this is going to happen based on these numbers. You don't need to be an expert for that kind of thing. You can just do it. Uh, the three types I've slightly mischievously characterized, the first being the flying car prediction. We all know people like this, and everything they say starts with, wouldn't it be cool if? Um, and that kind of prediction is just imagining a world that they'd like to live in and then thinking, yeah, let's do that then. It is nice to 
to, to be with these people, it's refreshing sometimes, it's invigorating, it's sometimes intensely annoying because sometimes the thing they think is cool is not actually going to be cool at all, it's not going to work and it's quite difficult to deal with them when that doesn't happen. The second kind of prediction is an extrapolation prediction. You take something that's happening already, you expect that it's going to get better or faster or cheaper or some combination of the three. We've been quite good at this kind of prediction and technology in the past. Uh, we predicted that computers would get smaller and faster to the point that they would fit in your pocket. They would have more sensors. We predicted that people would get more and more used to network technology. They did. We predicted that people would get much better at entering metadata when describing learning resources. Uh, the third of these is the um, apocalyptic um, brand of prediction. Now, this isn't um, uh, this isn't kind of back to the action movie thing. This is, I guess I'm cleaving closer to the apocalypse of St. John of um, Patmos, if anybody knows it. It's at the, um, it's at the weird end of the Bible. Um, and the way it works, he claims to have seen all of these things while sitting on a hill in um, in the Middle East. Um, and what it, the message basically is, is you were right everybody else was wrong. There are some people that make predictions like this. There are some people, possibly even in this room, that think, you know what, this World Wide Web has just been a bit of a fad, really. Um, eventually, we'll get beyond it. We'll get back to mainframes. We'll get back to real computers. And there are some people who think, you know, MOOCs are a bit silly. They're probably not going to be a thing. I know I was one of them. And we'll um, get back to to taking online learning seriously as um, a subject of pedagogy inquiry rather than mass broadcasting. There's lots of stuff like that. Uh, so this is my typology, I think, of um, prediction. This is the kind of things we can do. So we've got the expert, the lay, and we've got uh, the flying car, the extrapolation, and the apocalyptic. So uh this now has stopped working of course let me get back on there my slides are broken i feel like andrew ning and if anybody gets that reference thank you what does that say slideshow yes that's what i want slideshow resume slideshow one day we'll learn how to use powerpoint maybe right okay that's the story it's quite nice isn't it um starts at a place it goes up goes right down, that's the sad bit, and it goes back up again, ends up largely where it starts. This is a wave, it's a, um, actually a sine wave, but that's not really all that important. We can string them together. We can think, okay, these sine waves keep happening. There is a series, there is a pattern. This is an extension of the extrapolation idea of prediction. The stuff happens, it keeps happening, it continues to happen. Um, there's lots of examples of this. So we have at the top there the Kondratiev waves from economics. This is the idea that there are these epochs. And incidentally, the last epoch um, is generally reckoned to have ended in the early 90s at much the same way time as Eric Hobswam's short 20th century, if people are familiar with that, just before the time alt started. So all was the start of a new thing, and it was the start of an, um, a new age and a new idea. I'm not sure if anybody recognizes the bottom wave. Can people shout out if they do? Yeah. Yeah? You're meant to tell me what it is, not just say yeah. <laughs> it's the Gartner hype cycle, which is not a cycle, but they say it's a cycle. I've not seen anybody use that. I mean, I've been out of ed tech a bit in the last, like, 10 to 15 years, I think, it's, people seem to have stopped referring to it. You, um, you don't see presentation um, based on it anymore. Has anybody seen one of these in the wild recently? Oh, and what have you been doing with them? All right, okay. Okay. 
So, okay, so for um, people listening at home, there is um, um, a group of people called um, Something Geeks, was it? Yeah. Um, it'll be tweeted out on the alt hashtag so you can see it, and they play with these things. I think they've kind of died out, I mean, mainly because they're really, really stupid. Uh, it assumes every single innovation, every single technology stimulus goes through the same phases and then eventually dies out. They don't often talk about the swamp of the, the diminishing returns or the cliffs of obsolescence in their material. Everything's going to work. That's the dream they sell. Um, I mean, another word for this kind of thing is um, fashion, you know, things get cool and then they stop being cool and they start being ironically cool and then they kind of go away a bit and um come back we're apparently in the middle of a 90s revival um which i think will be demonstrated by the music choices later this evening uh so i mean the, um there are fashions in education technology there are cool things everybody talks about and then suddenly a couple of years later everyone's pretending it never happened we will get to a few of these later so i asked what we laughably call an ai at the moment um to let me know about the last 30 years of edtech and the next 30. this is the aria ai i like it because it's named after a funding council it's um built into the opera browser and it was just literally the one i had lying about so um, this is uh, looking specifically as the United, at the United Kingdom over the past 30 years and the next 30 years. The immediate thing we can see is four of them are the same. And also one of them is blockchain. <laughs> um, ignoring that latter, the fact we have four the same and all of the rest of them are quite kind of recognizable. There is a class of things that we expect to see in our predictions of the future of education technology. There is stuff that always turns up, internet of things, um, virtual reality and augmented reality. It will have its day one day soon if there are any um, true believers in the house. If there's not any true believers in the house, no, it won't. Um, so, there is a kind of thing that we see. It all seems hauntingly familiar. And the idea of AI as, um, or the kind of LLMs that we like to call AI at the moment, um, because they're not intelligent. And anybody who is trying to tell you otherwise is lying. And if you believe it is true, I have got a bridge that I'd like to sell you. Um, if you want to talk to me later on the bridge, uh, I mean, um, beat me in the bar. Um, an AI type tool like this sh should be good at this kind of thing, but it just seems to reel out the kinds of things that we say anyway. It looks right because it's the kind of predictions we make. A, um, a confirmation bias is what I see here. And it is haunting because AI is a haunting. It is the ghost in the machine. It's um, a repetition of everything that's ever been said on the internet. And it all comes back in a slightly different order. So um, if extrapolation, and um, big data tools are not really cutting it for our predictions. The alternative is you guys. We talk to experts. And um, in looking for an alternative to a large language model, I stumbled across the blog of Martin Weller. So back in 2025, 2025, that's not even happened yet. Back in 20, back at the 25th anniversary of Alt, whenever that was, you were there already. He, he, he literally lives in the future. He is a human keynote. It's, all of the stories are true. Uh, the, 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 he assigned an educational trend to every year from 1994 to initially 2017. He, he then published a book um, based on his blog post, which is a really good idea. People should do that um, in 2018. But he, he kept writing more chapters. So these were here. Um, his perceptions. A couple of things that stood out to me, um, e-learning standards in 2001, that's something we, 
we used to talk a lot about at all is standards and interoperability. I struggle to find any sessions this year on standards and interoperability. It's still a huge problem. It's still something that we need to deal with. It still constrains the kind of massive purchases IT managers make that you can't buy this thing because it doesn't talk to that thing. And if you're going to make it talk to that thing, you need to buy this thing to make it do it. Uh, we did have this idea once of open standards. It seems to have not be something we talk about currently. Uh, Web 2.0, huge peak. You, we will see this again and again in all the data that I show you. We will see um, Web 2.0, social media, blogs. Uh, that was a huge thing. We, round about the middle of the noughties, the, the, the late noughties, we, had this idea that social media is um, going to be an educational revolution, that it is a nice place for students to be. They can learn, they can make connections all over the world. Uh, I think history relates it did not turn out quite like that. There was a lot of optimism, a lot of hope in that part of the movement, which was something I really enjoyed. And it um, got us into interesting places like the world of connectivism, like the world of the MOOCs. Uh, stuff like DS106, all stuff like that. It, it really got us into some interesting places, but those kind of approaches were of the time. They're not possible now. I wouldn't stand here and recommend that um, a student um, needs to be on Twitter, but people do this. People did actually do that at the time. They said, we should get our students on Twitter. I mean, there's not even a Twitter anymore. It's um, named after a letter of some sort. Um, the coolest letter, in fact. Uh, just let that one stand where it is, really. Um, we talked about the MOOCs already. The personal learning environment is all is um, a really useful concept. It's not something we've heard a lot about um, recently, but it was a huge deal at all at the time. So uh, I think Martin would say that he, he was only looking um, backwards. He's not making um, predictions. He would. He wasn't actually basing it on data. He was basing it on gut feelings. There was not really a methodology behind it, apart from this is what I reckon, which is fair enough. Martin's been around EdTech for a long while. What he reckons, I I suspect, is what an expert reckons. Uh, so for that reason, this kind of stuff is worthwhile looking at trends in the past. Uh, a similar approach that looks at trends for the near future and um, relies on expert was what was called the NMC Horizon Project, now taken over by Educause. This is the slide I originally showed in um, 2015 when I first did a version of this presentation. I, I've up, updated it. Um, after that date, you'll spot they changed their methodology. They no longer make these explicitly predictions as of 2020, and they seem to have moved more into ideas of course design, of types of courses, of the way courses fit together. This is something that's always been a huge theme at Alt. It's never really made it into the NMC um, predictions. Um, these are done, by the way, and I know because I used to be involved, um, with a, um, a closed off wiki environment where people um, talk about stuff that they're predicting. Um, I think I was on the 2018 one and I tried to persuade them not to include blockchain. Um, they didn't, They did, but they um included it next year which you can take or leave really um the kind of patterns we see here again all of this um kind of blue stuff around 2006 2008 the web 2.0 um um boom the idea of the read write web which is another term we've not heard for a while uh lots of stuff on mobiles and tablets following straight enough after that uh, they were really into the idea of gesture-based uh, computing in 2010. I have no idea what happened to that. And then round about 2012, we start seeing the idea of learner analytics kind of creep into this stuff. It's a, um, a fascinating data set. I will uh, publish 
a version of this at some point. But what you're really here for, I think, is to know what people were talking about at Alt during all these years. I've used those same uh, categories and I have made a chart. Uh, thank you. A podcast listener in the house. Lovely. Um, there used to be a thing on the wonky uh, podcast. I work for wonky if that um, actually wasn't made clear at the start. Um, um, and that was a th whole thing, basically. So uh, the, um, this is not just any old chart. Oh, no, it's an interactive chart, as I hope to show you. Let's switch this through. Uh, so this is based on every single title of every single session I could find. I could only get back as far as 2003. I have one day of 2002, and I'm also missing 1998 and 1996. If anyone has any information on what was presented at those conferences, I would be really glad to include them in here. <laughs> Out. <laughs> we still have them in the archive as soon as digitization. Yeah, as soon as we get there, I'll add them to this. We can go right the way back. So this isn't actually 30 years, it is um 20 years. If you'd like um a conference ticket refund, ask Marin. <laughs> and she'll say no. But the reason I show you this, yeah, yeah, she no longer has the authority. Uh so what am I going to look at? Social, where's social? There. Um, we can see again that same pattern. There was a big peak, 2006, 2008. And we've always taught the idea about the idea of social, about the idea of social learning, about the idea of um, social interactions among students, between students and staff, all the rest of it. But that was the big peak. There were 150 papers in 2008 that actually had something to do with Web2 or social media or something like that. It's tailed down since. The other big peak I spotted was in 2021. Uh, I think social media became in 2021 suddenly a lot more important. Again, I think the time that we couldn't communicate, we fell back on that tool. And I think a lot of this stuff that happened over the pandemic was people falling back on um, tools. I mean, my first response being an old disk project manager was, okay, I'll have to Skype anyone. And then, I mean, what happened to Skype? That was no longer a thing. I'd not kept up with that area of tools whatsoever. Uh, let's look at another one briefly. Um, can't see what I've got here. So hang on there. Um, analytics. Uh, there was a big peak. Um, again, starting around about 2012, um, gone up to 2016, um, 2018, and then tailing down slightly. Analytics are here now. That's a thing. And the kind of presentations I've seen this year that focus on analytics have been very much focused on this is what we do um, rather than this is what we could do. Uh, or oh, there was one more I wanted to show. Let me see if I can find it. Uh, which one was it now? Uh, content, there we are. So always been a theme at all. There was a big peak between 2008 and 2012, 2000, and then a big kind of drop off up after 2012. That was because an organization named um, JISC decided to fund a load of projects based around content during that um, period. A big part of the history of alt um, presentations is the history of JISC um, projects. Every project needed to have a dissemination plan. Every project says we'll present a paper at Alt. So the big peaks during that year, um, those years, the big peak in the, the number of presentations is linked directly to the funding that was available. In some ways, these are not real trends. 
Um, these are trends that were caused by uh, program managers like myself and uh, like um, many of my uh, former colleagues. Um, so that I think is interesting to note. Uh, let's get rid of this. I have some more charts to show you later if you like charts, so don't worry about that. Um, I need to mention the data quality. It is incredibly variable. A lot of this is literally hand typed off um, PDFs. A lot of it is screen scraped. The quality of the data is appalling, frankly. I have done my best. I will continue to do my best, but it's not great. Uh, I want to thank um, a former... A, Association for Learning Technology, Learning Technologists of the Year from 2008, whom I, ha I had the incredible foresight to get married to, who um, helped me to do this coding. Uh, some sessions are impossible to meaningfully tag. Lots of people like to do alt sessions that are a pun um, but, um, based on the acronym of a project that is just no longer a thing anymore. And the pun and the project are lost to the mist of time. Um, and the, 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 um, there is some earlier data that we can get to. So this is 3,313 conference sessions. This is a lot of conversations. Five minutes, really? Oh, dear. We might slightly overrun, but I'll, I'll go quickly. Um, these are all the conference themes. Uh, the conference themes themselves are interesting. I could spend a lot more time on them, but I mean, these also had an impact on what was discussion. Um, discussed. People like to write about the themes. So to shift forward, to shift right backwards, right to the start, Alt 1994, the first Alt-C conference. Now, to, uh, to understand this, you need to understand where Alt um, came from. It was an outgrowth of the Computers in Teaching initiative, which was funded by Hefke. The Computers in Teaching initiative became the LTSN subject centers, which became the LTSN network more generally, which became the Higher Education Academy, which became Advanced HE. Uh, so these were all at various times funded by HEFKE, the um, Higher Education Funding Council for England. Uh, the aim of the first ALT was to bring together all of the people in, these, in this computers and teaching initiative and to get them chatting about stuff. It was not really meant to be a research conference. It was bringing people together a talk about, and they even put this in capitals, winning solutions from corporate strategy to courseware design. Uh, it was a what's worked thing. It's like, okay, we're all struggling with this stuff. This is what we do. I think Alt is still a lot like that. A lot of people come to Alt, not because they want to find out what is the next best um, um, big thing in um learning technology, because, but because um, they're struggling with stuff, everybody else is struggling with stuff, and they all want to get together, and they want to sort it all out. Then the, the nature of um, presentations has changed numerous times over the years. This is a graph I made ages ago. Um, you can, uh, this is a graph of all of the funding for teaching quality enhancement that has been spent by the government over the um, years. It stops in 2018. I would have updated it, but I mean, what's the point? Uh, it's not really worth it. This is it. So all the way through that um, period, a large part of Alt's life, the kind of things we talked about it here were dictated by what was being funded, were dictated by what um, uh, policymakers thought were interesting. I think those days have gone. Um, I think the kind of things that are presented at all now are quite different in um, um, nature. A lot, a lot of those projects were useful. They were kind of theoretical. They might not have actually really gone anywhere in many cases, but what they did do is they brought together a community. And the alt community, I think, is the last expression of that community when it comes to learning technology. Um, people who think about and talk about this stuff, sharing ideas, that has cemented the community. And whereas it's um, difficult to argue that that was the best outcomes for all of that funding, it adds up to a lot 
of funding if you add everything together. Incidentally, we're talking close to a billion pounds, I believe, into this stuff. So it stands to reason that we would be quite good at it at this point. It's interesting that we're not better, but it stands to reason that we're pretty good. So how does this end? This is a picture of a flying car. You could buy it in 1949. Nobody wanted it. Um, people don't want flying cars. People don't want this revolution in um, higher education that everybody is um, talking about. People have problems. People want to find solutions. The solutions might not be big or flashy. In fact, a lot of the time they are a Google Sheet. I understand. Um, but these little scrappy tools, this like quasi commercial, not really a part of the IT system, when it really hit, um, when the pandemic was in full flight, those were the things that we reached for. We reached for Zoom, we reached for Google Docs, we reached for stuff that we knew just worked. So who designs our future? There has been a tendency in Alt and in, the, in this community more widely to have a lot of um, a lot of sessions, a lot of conversations about this is things that we can now do with technology. Um, and it's interesting, it's nice to play with new forms of um, technology. It's, mm, it's quite nice to ask um, mm, chat um, GPT stupid questions and to get stupid action, um, stupid answers from it. It's quite nice to look at the latest, greatest um, expensive content and think, oh, wouldn't it be lovely to do that? That's not the stuff that has historically come out of alt. We don't invent the big stuff. We invent the stuff that works. There's a case to be made that alt is responsible for the way learning technology is used in universities and colleges um, at the moment. There is a case to be made that the UK has had an impact globally a lot wider than it would um, suggest. And there was, there is a case to be made that um, JISC, which has a similar um, lifetime, a similar lifespan to ALT, was really our equivalent of ARPA. It invented a lot of stuff. A lot of it didn't work. Some of it got um, taken on and become and became part of something massive. So all I wanted to close with um, in terms of who designs our um, future, the answer is you guys. It's um, not the vendors, it's not the policy makers, it's um, not the hype that we see online, it's you guys solving the problems that you have in front of you with the people that you work with. If you're in a series of um, innovation, this is um, lead user theory writ large, this is Von Hippel. Um, that's who needs to design the future. And the question I would like to leave you with is, is that something you'd like to do? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I know we are slightly over time, but I just Apologies. want to give a, a moment for any points of clarification. Before we do, and to give you a piece of um, moment to catch your breath, I have two excellent pieces of news for all of you with us in this room. The gala dinner venue is fully air conditioned. Hey, yes. And the bar opens in 57 minutes. So there is nothing standing between you and a cool a bit of entertainment at the end of this evening. But if you're up for two or three questions, yeah, if you if you give it a go. I'll answer questions as long as people have them. Um, we'll try and repeat them for the online audience. So if you start with, this is more of a statement than a question and go on for five minutes, please keep in mind there are people listening yeah. online. Um, if you're going to do that, um, if you could leave the room, that'd be great. <laughs> so do we have any particular questions or comments? Yes. Uh, I can see a troublemaker well, over there. Should we start with Martin and then go over to Helen? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the conference theme, uh, conference um, furniture is stuff like, here's how to do um, CMALT. Here's a meeting of a SIG. 
here's um, a meet and greet session. You know, it's just like stuff that happens. There's not been that many presentations about sofas at all that I know about. Now we have literally not none of that. I mean, there's, there's tiny bits of OFS funding to very specific things that are actually specific. Whereas a lot of that was was blue sky, you know, like think of yeah. to do it. Um, I'm just bring this down so you can speak it. Yeah. So really the question is, what is the different what do you see as a sort of observer of the sector as the difference between the levels of innovation and sort of student satisfaction then and now where we've got so we've got no funding and we'd shed loads of funding what's the difference um in response to that i want to speak very briefly on the idea of small uh projects i did not like big projects i don't think we got a lot of value out of big projects small um projects that would sustain somebody's time long enough to kind of follow up a hunch and to see if something worked or not i think we got a lot of um value out of that the problem the sector faces at the moment is that i mean nobody has any time to do anything everybody's at 125 percent of their contracted hours um doing all the stuff they need to do and all the extra stuff that they have to do because if they don't do it nobody else will do it and the whole thing will fall apart that's not sustainable i mean that whole sector is massively underfunded it um needs an in, um an injection of um recurrent uh funding it also needs um um an injection of um capital as well um a lot of the um assets owned by the sector are aging they will need replacing this is stuff like um campus here this is something like um stuff like i mean big um technologies um if i was asked i would say i would like the sector funding settlement uh, before a long way before any projects but i think projects are valuable um number of institutions will support people internally i think that is uh fantastic but i know the um bulk of what um has been presented at the conference so far and will be uh, presented tomorrow has been written by enthusiasts sitting at their kitchen table at the weekend because that's what they want to do and in some ways that is humbling that is um touching it is an incredible commitment this community makes but in some ways it should not have to be like this it should not be that we're doing this stuff in our own time um we had a question i think from seb as yeah. well do you have a question? You had your hand up. Okay. So uh, I should say that between 2002 and 2012, I was in Marin's role. Um, and there were two observations I wanted to make. One was, I've only been here today, but that feeling that the people presenting are kind of doing stuff that's really close to their heart rather than a kind of dissemination mm. um effort because they've had a funded project is very palpable i really noticed that i've not been yeah. to the art conference and for 10 years and the other thing i wanted to say was that in the period i was working for out we rather in a very mannered way um messed about each year coming up with a jazzy conference title and deciding on themes mm. and i do think that the working out what were the key things going on from the paper titles it is a bit confounded by the fact yeah. that the center was giving shape to what was seen as an appropriate thing to put a proposal in about and yeah. i think that's a kind of a complicating factor that 
is worth bearing in mind. You're absolutely right on that latter one. I should explain um, briefly that I would like to have done an assessment um, of the kinds of people that present at Alt-C, their job titles. I would love to have given a presentation on the split by um, gender. I think that would have been absolutely um, fascinating. Um, uh, unfortunately, I would also have liked to have done some deep um, text analysis on conference abstracts, which I think is something that could get us closer to what people were actually talking about. Unfortunately, in the majority of uh, cases, the data doesn't exist. So I couldn't plot it. I couldn't uh, do anything with it because it's just not there. We are, have lost such a lot of um, the institutional memory of all. And the idea of you shredding those conference proceedings, <laughs> I am... I, I am livid. Yes, but um, in terms of the conference scenes, you did see that every year people would do a little uh, pun that was based on the theme. I did, actually did it for this session because that's what you do at all. It became an alt thing. But I mean, I um, I coded it just by um, as a conference attendee was um, just reading the title and saying, well, what's that going to be about then? And you spot the keywords, the key phrases. If you spot um, learning design, you know exactly what that's going to be about. And that's always been the case. And it always will be the case. You know broadly what you're going to get. So that's the kind of level of um, coding that I've done. I would have loved to have done more. Any final questions before we wrap up? OK, in um, one more. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, David. Um, my question is, does it matter? Because, <laughs> and I'll contextualize that. So I'm a big fan of Alan Kay, who invented the laptop and various other um, you know, things that we take for granted today. When he talked about innovating, he, he says that the present dominates and new isn't new, it's news. Mm. And to actually do meaningful things to innovate, you have to remove the present and the past and make your own future mm. and then go there. so do is this it's very valuable work but should we be removing it from our minds and just thinking about the future that's a really really good question um the, i think the idea of us looking to the past of education technology is important because i mean as i hinted at the start of the presentation there are some cycles there are some stuff that keeps coming back and back and back um is there stuff we could learn uh currently from the last time people got really excited about artificial intelligence in the late 70s quite possibly is there stuff we could learn about um teaching at school uh, um at scale with the early um the, from the early MOOCs experiments, I think there probably is. The problem is um, not that if we look at the past, we can't innovate. It's more along the lines if if we can't look at the past, we are continually going to be coming up with the same stuff and solving the same um, problems. I mean, as you know, large amounts of education um, technology and indeed large amounts of the internet are held together largely with the code equivalent of duct tape and and um, string. That you know, um, people have made a fix that is good enough. Um, people have um, come up with a schema or a standard that did the job at the time, and then people have just um, built on that until we've reached the limitations of that early decision. Um, we always need to be aware of what, el um, what else is in the playground before we start um, to play, I think. Thank you. And um, very warm thanks from us, David. Thank you for the research. We hope this is a piece of work to be continued as so. we add to the, the data of our history. But please put your hands together one more time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.
Um, I should say I will be um, publishing all of the data. I will write up the presentation of the blog post somewhere, uh, probably in, in the next couple of days. Uh, so it, if you're interested in this stuff, it'll be out there for you to play with.